We've already seen how our Port Noir works as a gateway for Central Africa. We have looked at how ports everywhere form the beating heart of global trade and how they struggle with congestion, customs and capacity. But the real question we need to ask now is, how do we make ports resilient for the future? Ports today are under pressure from every direction. Trade volumes are rising, ships are getting bigger, climate risks are accelerating, geopolitics is as unpredictable as ever, and customers, whether they're retailers, manufacturers or consumers, are demanding greener, faster and more reliable supply chains. The truth is, these aren't challenges a single port operator can solve. They're strategic challenges that demand governments, investors and international institutions step up. And they're challenges that land squarely on the shoulders of the customers who rely on the ports to keep their business moving. Let's start with governments. Ports are not just commercial hubs. They are the national strategic assets. They underpin jobs, food security, energy security and tax revenues. Without ports, economies grind to a halt. That's why governments almost always play a role, either as owners through port authorities or as regulators setting safety, security and investment rules. But here's the tension. Governments, they want ports to be efficient and profitable, yet they also have to protect jobs, ensure security and keep trade flowing even during crisis. And it won't surprise you to learn that ports are political. In Africa and Asia, you can see China's Belt and Road Initiative funding port expansions, often in return for long-term influence. Western nations counter with smaller development programs, but the geopolitical game is clear. Whoever funds the port shapes the trade, which raises a critical question. Should governments treat ports the same way they treat airports or power grids as critical national infrastructure that deserves direct investment and protection? Because when governments delay, it's not just a port that suffers, it's a manufacturer in Kinshasa whose raw materials are stuck in customs. It's a farmer in Central African Republic who can't get fertilizer in time for planting. It's a retailer in Europe waiting for a container of timber that's still sitting in Port Noir. Government choices cascade down the chain, all the way to the customer. Then there's the climate question. Ports, by definition, sit at sea level. That makes them uniquely exposed to sea level rises, storm surges and extreme weather. The UN estimates that billions of dollars of trade are at risk each year from climate-related port disruptions. And the most vulnerable ports are often in developing countries in Africa, Asia and the Pacific. These are the economies most dependent on trade, and yet they have the least capital to build seawalls, storm-proof terminals or resilient infrastructure. Is it fair that the poorest nations whose ports feed global supply chains carry the greatest exposure to climate risk, while wealthier nations reap the benefits? Think of a customer story. A coffee exporter in Central Africa misses a shipment because their port is flooded. A cocoa farmer in West Africa you know, sees beans spoil while waiting for a delayed vessel. A supermarket shopper in Europe pays more for groceries because the supply chain was disrupted weeks earlier. Climate change hits ports first, but it's customers, exporters, retailers and consumers who ultimately pay the price. That makes port resilience a question of global fairness. If the world depends on these gateways, shouldn't the world also help defend them? Even without climate change, ports are some of the most capital-intensive businesses in the world. Expanding a port means dredging deeper harbours to fit bigger ships. It means buying automated cranes that cost millions each. It means building container yards, upgrading roads and rail lines, and installing IT systems to manage it all. These projects run into billions, and the pressure is constant. Global supply chains keep demanding more, e-commerce surges, ship size increase, sustainability standards require ports to electrify fleets and provide green fuels. But the investment pace is uneven. Rotterdam, Singapore and Shanghai pour billions into expansion and automation. Meanwhile, ports like Port Noir struggle with congested and outdated facilities. That creates a two-speed world. A handful of world-class ports move forward while many others fall behind. And who suffers? It's the customers. Shippers face higher freight prices. Factories miss production targets because containers are delayed. Retailers lose whole seasons because goods arrive late. When ports can't keep pace, the investment gap becomes a competitive gap for entire economies and for every customer that depends on them. Automation is often presented as a solution. And there's good reason for that. At a port of Long Beach in California, one terminal now runs almost entirely on automation. Cranes are remote controlled, driverless vehicles move containers, predictive scheduling systems optimize the flow. The result? 
faster turnaround, lower emissions, and of course, a safer yard. In Rotterdam, we have uh, unmanned electric vehicles that ferry containers across the yard, automated stacking cranes built, you know, neat rows where, without human drivers. The entire system is designed for maximum efficiency and minimum error. And in Singapore, in the Toast Megaport, is consolidating all terminals into one fully automated facility, capable of handling 65 million containers annually by 2040. It will be run by AI, powered by automation, and designed from the ground up for resilience. For customers, automation means fewer delays, more reliable schedules, and of course, lower cost. Retailers can plan promotions with confidence. Manufacturers can trust more of a just-in-time delivery. Consumers see stocked shelves instead of shortages. But automation is expensive. It requires deep technical skills, and it can be politically sensitive. Unions and dock workers often resist it, fearing job losses. Uh, automation is bad for the workforce. You know, technology is supposed to, supposed to enhance our lives. It's not supposed to take away uh, our lives. So the big question is, can ports in Africa or South America leapfrog straight to automation? Or will they be stuck making incremental upgrades while the rest of the world moves ahead? Because for the customer, whether it's a farmer exporting cocoa or a car maker importing steel, the difference between modern automation and outdated processes is the difference between staying competitive and falling behind. Let's look at the manufacturer. A car plant in Europe relies on copper and cobalt from Africa. When Port Noir clogs, shipments are delayed, production targets are missed, workers stand idle, contracts with dealers are breached. For a manufacturer, a port delay is a factory shutdown. Let's have a look at the retailer. A fashion retailer in London needs stock in November for Christmas. Congestion at Long Beach means shipments arrive in January. Seasons lost. The clothes are heavily discounted. Profit is wiped out. The exporter. Let's go back to our friend, the coffee exporter. A coffee cooperative in Uganda has beans ready for export. Congestion at Mombasa means the container misses its vessel. Weeks go by, quality declines. A premium buyer cancels. For the exporter, a port delay is a broken livelihood. And of course, the consumer. And at the end of the chain, it's ordinary people. A parent in Paris paying more for groceries. A teenager in New York waiting months for a new phone. A farmer in Kinshasa unable to buy fertilizer in time for planting. All of these stories have the same root, a port under pressure. So here are the big questions we face. Should governments and global institutions co-invest in climate defenses, recognizing ports as global public goods, not just local assets? Is automation the only viable way to handle future trade volumes, or will it create new vulnerabilities through over-reliance on technology? Can the world afford a two-speed port system, where some countries enjoy world-class service while others are left behind in bottlenecks? And how do we make sure the benefits of resilient, sustainable modern ports spread beyond the richest economies? to the very regions where resilience matters most. Ports are no longer invisible infrastructure. They are on the front page when ships block canals, when containers stack up offshore, or when storms flood terminals. They are national assets, climate front lines, and global bottlenecks. The fairness question is unavoidable. The world depends on ports in developing nations, but those nations shoulder most of the risk and cost. The capital question is urgent. Without massive investment, many ports will simply fall behind the demands of global trade. The automation question is open. Long Beach, Rotterdam and Singapore show what's possible. But the real test is whether those advances can spread to the ports where they're needed most. And the customer story is clear. When ports falter, it's manufacturers, retailers, exporters and consumers who feel the pain. Because ports don't just move containers, they move economies. And the resilience of global supply chains depends on whether we can choose to make every port not just a select few fit for the future.